You are listening to The Green Flame, the DGR broadcast that brings you radical analysis, practical skills, and artistic expression from the grassroots to the global. I am your host, Jennifer Mernan. Thank you for joining us for this episode of The Green Flame. On this episode of The Green Flame, we feature an interview of Derek Jensen by Beth Robson. Beth Robson is an inhabitant of the Salish Sea and a rights of nature defender of the land she inhabits. Derek Jensen is the author of over 25 books, a longtime environmental activist and founder of Deep Green Resistance. In this conversation, Beth and Derek talk about making our loyalty to the land itself and making our curiosity to the land as well. During the interview, as well as in our Skillshare for this episode, Derek speaks to listening to the land. We wish to express our gratitude for the music of Skaggs and a big thank you not only to the musical group, but to Anita Stewart, who worked to get us permission to share this music with you. Again, thank you so much for joining us, and now on to our program. I'm Elizabeth Robson. My guest today is Derek Jensen. Derek is a longtime grassroots environmentalist and is the author of more than 25 books, including A Language Older Than Words and The Culture of Make-Believe. So Derek, thank you for all your books and your work to defend the natural world and for being on the podcast. Well, thanks for having me and thanks for your work in defense of the natural world. One of the many questions we get when we talk to people in the community about rights of the Salish Sea is who will speak for the Salish Sea, meaning in a court of law? That question begs another question, which is how can we speak for the Salish Sea in a court of law if we don't listen regularly to the sea, if we don't ask the sea who she is and what she wants? So I'd like to begin by having you read your essay, Pretend You're a River, because that essay expresses so beautifully what it means to really listen to a river or to any natural being. And if you don't mind also including a little bit of the story about how you came to write it and your experience of listening to a stream, that would be great. So the way I wrote this is I was, I was trying to write, I was trying to do a couple things. I was trying to write something from the perspective of a stream near my home and I was also trying to, I was wondering if I could describe something not by how its borders differentiate, differentiate it from its neighbors, such that if we talk about me, then I, you know, basically end at my skin and the couch here ends at the end of the fabric and you know, the the cat is what's inside this this bag of skin and fur, and then everything outside is is not that cat. And I was wondering if we could describe something not by its separations, but by its connections. I didn't even know what I meant at the time. I was just thinking, okay, can we do this? And then I was trying to just to write something. What it would be like to be from the perspective of the river? And then it, it occurred to me that that's actually kind of silly because why would I try to make up what it's like to be a river when I live, you know, I'm, I'm, I was sitting at that moment 30 yards from a stream and I could just go ask it. That'd be like me trying to describe what it's like to be you without asking you. So I went down to the stream and I asked the question. I remember it was, it was, this is a temperate rainforest here, and it was it was misting on that day. And I went down and I asked the stream, "What is it like to be you?" And, and before I go on, I want to I want to say that I realized in that moment that that's that's really the fundamental question of all relationships that I don't think is asked often enough. And 
Um, even in relationships that we have that are um, long term with with humans, I, I don't think we ask that often. Enough. My my mom died um, fourteen months, thirteen, 15, fourteen months ago, and literally five minutes after she uh, entered terminal delirium, so she could no longer speak. I and and I had spent every evening with her for the previous twenty years. At five minutes after she entered terminal delirium and could no longer speak, I came up with a dozen questions I wished I would have asked. And I've realized in the time since that even with my mom, my relationship with her was defined with her being my mom. I there were things I didn't ask her about her experience that were were her as a person as opposed to her and her relationship to me and i i think that we we rarely ask what is it like to walk through the world as a bear what is it like and the point is we i don't think we should ask the universe i think we should ask the bear what is it like to walk through the through the world as a, as a bear we should ask the cat we should ask the tree and so that was one thing I realized in that moment. We don't ask that often enough. The other thing I realized is that they're they're dying to tell us because all I said to the stream was, what is it like to be you? And this flood of, of words and images came to me, and I, I basically stood there for two seconds, and then I ran as fast as I could back into the house to grab a pen and then write as quickly as I could, and this is what emerged. Pretend you're a river. Pretend you are the mist who falls so fine, so gentle, that nothing separates water and air. You're the rain who falls in sheets, explodes onto the ground to leave pox and puddles. You're the ground who receives this water, soaking it up, taking it in, carrying it deep inside. You're the cracks and fissures where the waters accumulate, flow, fall to join more water and more, in pools and rivers who move slowly through cavities, crevices, pores. You're the sounds and silence of water seeping or staying still. You're the meeting of wet and dry, the union of liquid and solid, where solids dissolve and liquids solidify. You are the pressure who pushes water through seams. You're the rushing water who bubbles from the earth. You're a tiny pool between rocks. You overflow, find your way to join others who, like you, are moving, moving. You are the air at the surface of the water, the joining of substantial and insubstantial the union of under and over, weight and not weight. You are the riffle, the rapid, the tiny waterfall who turns water to air and air to water. You are the mist who settles on the soil. You are the plants who drink the mist, and you are the sun who warms and feeds them. You are the fish who feed on insects, who feed on plants, who feed on soils, who feed on fish. You are the fish who become soils, who become plants, who become insects, who become fish, who flow down the river. You are the river who joins other rivers to become a new river who has all the rivers and something else. You are the river. You don't stop at the banks where liquid turns to solid. You reach into the sky and into the soil. Water moves through rocks, comes up to form pools far from the fast flow where the rivers move together, seeps down to join still waters deep below the surface, waters who sleep and wake and sleep and mingle with the stones who are the river too. You are the river, who is married to the mountains you have known since they were young, who have given themselves to you as you have given yourselves to them. You are the canyons you nestle into each year deeper than the year before. You are the forests who give you their fallen trees and the meadows who you flood and feed and who feed you back their fruits and fine insects who fly to your surface to be taken in by the fish who with their own bodies again feed the meadows. You are the river who feeds the ocean, who feels the tides pushing and pulling against your mouth, the waves mixing fresh and salt. You are that intermingling. That's who you are. That's who you've always been. You are the river. You've lived with volcanoes and glaciers. You've been dammed by lava and ice. You've carried log jams so large and so old they grow their own forests with you running beneath. You live through droughts and floods. You are the river. You miss the salmon. You miss the sturgeon. You miss the ocean. You miss the meadows. You miss the forests. You miss the beavers and otters and grizzly bears. You miss the human beings. You are the river. You want them back. You want to feel the tickling of the sturgeon, the thrusting of the salmon. You want to carry food and soil to the ocean. You want to cover the meadows as you used to, and you want to give yourself to them. You want them to give themselves to you as you have done forever, and they have too. 
That's so beautiful. Thank you so much for reading that. It's. I think it's probably my favorite thing of everything you've written. Yeah, and I didn't read. I didn't write it. The, uh, <laughs> the river did. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so when when you've talked to people about listening to nature, do people say, "Oh, I feel weird sitting and trying to listen to a tree or or a stream," or do they instantly grasp what it means to listen to a river or a tree? Well, I think I, I think rivers and trees are a little bit harder, but. The the response that I have generally gotten from people is there's a dissonance between public and private discourse because if you talk about them privately, talk to them privately, they'll they will talk about communications with with non humans all the time, except they never talk about it in the public because they're afraid everybody's going to think they're crazy, and and the easy ones are you know people who have pets you. You can tell when the, the, the cat's food dish is empty because it goes and sits next to the cat dish, stares at the cat dish, stares at you, stares at the cat dish, and, you know, communication has taken place. And then the, the way I, I think about it is, you know, you and I are communicating here, and uh, we're using English, a language both of us know, and there is still room for plenty of confusion. And... A great example from many years before my mom died was that uh, uh, she had a washer and dryer at her house, and I did not have one of mine, so I'd bring my clothes over and do them. And I was folding my towels, and my mom came over and said, do you want some help? That's literally what she said. Do you want some help folding your towels? And, you know, we all have histories with our mothers, and what I heard her say is, you're doing it wrong. And so she said, would you like some help folding the towels? I said, no. And she said, okay, that's fine, whatever, and walked away. And so even when you know somebody really well, it's still possible to have confusion, even when words are defined clearly. And I know a a really classic example of this would be one person says to another person, I love you, and the other person's like, uh, does that mean that you want to keep hanging out with me? Does that mean you want to have sex with me? Does that mean that you want to marry me? What does that mean? What, what does that mean? Um, and that's with three simple words. So that's if we speak English. And now think about how um, more fraught with the idea of projection it would be if you speak English and I only speak Swahili. You know, we could still gesture we could still, you know, we could still point to the cup and point to the water dish. I mean, point to the, the water faucet that one of us was going to get some water. Um, we could we could nod and and point when you say, "Would you like to add some, you know, would you like some hot chocolate, whatever?" But the language there would be a lot of room for misunderstanding. And then when you take it another step, what if it's a human and a gorilla, we still both speak primate, but we don't speak human even. And then if you take it another step so that one person speaks human and then the other person is a dog, then that person speaks mammal still, but they don't speak primate, the gestures, and you keep um, moving farther and farther away or further and further away. And there's more and more room for projection. And that said, um, so many people that I've talked to over the decades, and this is not just, you know, tree huggers or bunny huggers or, you know, animal rights activists or environmentalists. This is, this is just regular people. If you talk to them in private, so many of them will have some intense story about how there was this moment of communication with a tree line on a hill um, silhouetted against an uh, evening sky that, that, that was one of the most profound moments of their life. Or, you know, some day when they were feeling really down and they sat, they, they leaned up against a tree and, and received something from the tree. And so many people have those. It's just they don't often speak about them in public because 
if you do, you um, will be soundly ridiculed. Do you think that we should start speaking more publicly about it so that it becomes more normal? Well, it's in the right circumstances. And I think um, I think there are times to do it and times not to. And what I think about is that we used to file timber sale appeals when I lived up in Spokane. That's the Forest Service would put out this timber sale and it would be illegal and we would find how it's illegal and we would say you can't put it out because it's illegal. And we were working within you know, within the, the, the legal system on that. And there were a few people who would file these timber sale appeals who would not sign them themselves, but instead would sign them with, um, like, we're speaking for the voles. And we would put little, like a footprint of a vole as, a, as their signature, a footprint of a fox. And I understood what they were doing, and that's really good. But at the same time, some of the Forest Service people were sort of rolling their eyes at it. And... That's part of the difficulty is that you have to – there's this line from, a, from some thriller novel I read a while back that has always stuck with me, which is uh, the first person through the door always gets shot. And in the case of talking about non-human communication, the first person through the door gets laughed at. So, so yeah, I do think it's very important to talk about it, and I think it's important to, to choose – you know, there's, there's, there's this thing I've always remembered from Neil Everenden's The Natural Alien, which is just a fabulous book. And it's the first book I ever read that didn't take this culture's perspective that the natural world consists of resources to be exploited as a given. And, um, for example, there's a part in there where he's talking about what do you do if you give some impassioned defense of some creature? And at the end of it, the other person, the person you're talking to says, well, what good are they? And he says, well, the only response you can really give is, well, what good are you? And not to impugn them, but to point out the stupidity of that question. And, um, and of course, salmon have the right to exist for their own sake, and they're also incredibly valuable to forests. And anyway, Neil Everton gives us this example of, I think he calls it the philosopher, the environmentalist dilemma or something. I don't remember what he calls it. But it's about a... He says, there's a, pretend there's a court, and in this, a judicial court, and in this court, there are two sets of rules. One set of rules for if a person is 100% black, another set of rules for if the person has 1% of white blood in them. If there's a tiny bit of white blood, then they have a much easier set of rules. And he said, if you're a defense attorney defending somebody, do you try to argue that your client has 1% blood, a 1% white blood, and in so doing, reinforce the racist nature of the court? Or do you make a stand and, and argue this whole judicial system, this double set of judicial systems, is unfair, systematically unfair, and racist? And if you do that, your client will die. We face the same thing environmentally. If we go in and argue that you need to protect land because it has value or species because they have value on their own and not economic value, our arguments get devalued. But if we argue that we need to protect them because they have economic value, then that's reinforcing the idea that the economic system is more important than the real world. So it's a dilemma that, 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 that is faced, and I think that, frankly, the rights of nature people are, um, have approached this in one of the ways that, that, is, uh, that is very, very helpful and useful in doing both attempting to protect places and showing that the, um, that the system itself is unsustainable and... Um, and aimed at uh, permitting and encouraging the destruction of the planet. Yeah, it it does feel like that to me too. And then we run into, you know, the concerns that people have with, well, how do you enforce a law like that? And, you know, if it's especially if it's a broad rights of nature law, 
um, and we're not targeting something very specific like fracking or sludge dumping. You know, it's still it's an incredibly difficult approach um, because it does challenge the ways that people think about our normal way of being in the world and the rules that we follow <laughs> in the world. You know, one, one of the things that and, and this is not a problem with the rights of nature movement. This is a problem with the culture in general is, you know, your, your sort of first question um, at the very beginning of the interview was, was you were saying who speaks for the river. And part of the problem is that I've long since become convinced that 90% of, or I'm not going to put a percentage, most of, most of our intellectual capacity is not used for actually figuring things out, but most of our intellectual capacity is used for providing justifications or claims to virtue for what we wanted to do anyway. And we've seen this in forests that there has been logging, a lot of logging. So I'll back up. And Robert J. Lifton talked about before, before you can commit any mass atrocity, you have to convince yourself and others that what you're doing is not harmful. You're not doing a terrible thing, but you're in fact doing a virtuous, a good thing. And so from the perspective of the Nazis, which is what he was talking about, from the perspective of the Nazis, they weren't committing mass murder and genocide. They were purifying the Aryan race. They were, they were doing a good thing from their own perspective. Of course, what they were really doing was committing mass murder and genocide. They were doing a horrible thing. And the same is true I mean, the same is true on a personal level. I have never once in my life been a jerk, um, which is, of course, nonsense. I have objectively been a jerk many times, but every time I've been a jerk, I have had it rationalized that my behavior, you know, R.D. Lang wrote about how we act according to the way we experience the world. If you can understand somebody's experience, you understand their behavior. And another way to say this is that no matter how crazy you are, even if you're hearing voices that are telling you to do terrible things, you're hearing voices. You're, what you're doing makes sense in, inside your own internal construct. And the way this applies to forests is that, you know, I've written for 25 years now about the different claims to virtue that have been used and continue to be used by the timber industry for deforestation. So they will argue, I mean, they've literally argued you can't, that, that, that forests are in a state of environmental collapse and in order to help improve the forest health, we need to cut them down. They're making this argument right now all across the West, saying there's so much beetle kill that we need to cut these down to prevent uh, to prevent further the, the beetles from from going further. Which, of course, when they're doing that, they're probably also killing the trees who are resistant to the beetles. It doesn't matter. The point is that one of the things we always have to protect against is that seek get rights? There will be people who will argue that um, this means you need to kill all the sea lions because the Salish Sea needs the sea lions gone, or you need to kill all the. It doesn't matter what. I mean, there are people who still argue that uh, that seals. I mean, they're, they're arguing this right now with sea lions, and they're arguing that seals need to be killed because they kill the fish that other people want to kill for for fish sticks. And so I guess what I'm trying to say is that there are a lot of people who are really dishonest. And, and when we talk about who would, who would speak for the Sailor Sea, that implies a certain amount of integrity, which, and, you know, with the point I was making earlier about how when you're, you know, you and I can write up a contract that's very clear as to, you know, you and I are going to go for a ride to the store and we can write up a contract or we're going to, you and I are going to share a ride from Seattle to Reno and we can write up a contract that says, uh, since we're taking your car, I will pay for precisely 75% of gas and if a tire blows out, I will replace it. We can, we can do that because we both speak English and, or it wouldn't matter. We could both speak German. It would still be the same. But the point is that, I mean, I hate to be talking this way because it's so damn obvious that 
you know, a river does not want to be dammed and it wants the salmon. If a salmon bearing river wants the salmon in them. And nonetheless, I just read this article last night saying, oh, what a surprise when you deforest, uh, when you cut down trees in a tropical rainforest, it harms the soil and the forest might never recover. And my comment on that was, huh, you know, actually Plato wrote about the effects of deforestation on uh, soil quality in ancient Greece. And Mencius, Chinese philosopher, a couple thousand years ago, wrote about the effects of deforestation on Chinese soil. It's like, this is not new. And so my point is, there will be people arguing. I mean, I guarantee that if, uh, what is Slade Gorton's fish company? Uh, well, anyway, if the, if the Gorton family people were in charge of, of the Salish Sea, if they were to speak for the Salish Sea, they would be arguing for taking every last fish out. Yeah. Sorry for talking about topic. Oh, no, that's okay. I think it's actually on topic because when I think about the complexity of the Salish Sea, I can easily get overwhelmed with, oh, my gosh, I have to run out and try to understand how every little piece of it works in order to feel like I can speak for the Salish Sea in a court of law if it came to that. And then I remember, well, actually, no, there's some really big obvious things that should be obvious to everybody, like we shouldn't be transporting oil through the Salish Sea types of things. Um, that I don't have to know that much. It's completely obvious that, that that's something that we should stop. Well, that's one of the good things about, about this culture being so incredibly destructive is that there's so much low hanging fruit that we can't, the, 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 that we can say is obviously bad. Um, you know, I've been thinking, I'm going to write a book one of these days about, I've got a few other books in queue in front of it, but it'll, it'll be there someday about, about feeding um, feeding, feeding animals and whether it's good or bad. And I think about it a lot, but let's say I get a bunch of bread and I throw it out consistently. Um, that's fine. That's, I, I, I firmly believe that we should help non-humans because they're basically all refugees at this point. You know, we've killed the sand, we've killed everything, we've killed their food sources. We need to, we need to feed the forest. We need to feed them stuff. And but then I was thinking, okay, so if I throw out, let's, this is a hypothetical example, if I throw out a bunch of bread, that might attract possums, raccoons, and foxes. And that's nice that there's more raccoons, foxes, and possums, but then again, um, those three all eat uh, the eggs of ground-dwelling birds. So if I feed them, am I harming them? The point is that, yes, they're do very complex interactions pretty quickly, but that doesn't alter the fact that we can say that the forest does not actually want to be cut down. We can say that. Whether or not it wants for you to have more, you know, five more foxes in it than, than not, I don't know. That's, that, that would be a good question. But we can, we can say definitively it does not want for the trees to be cut down and removed. Yes. See, one of the questions that I wanted to ask you was about this idea of responsibility, as we've been talking to people about the rights of the Salish Sea, one of the things we talk about is our responsibilities to the Salish Sea. And it feels like when we think about responsibilities and the and rights, rights and responsibilities, that we automatically get the idea that, you know, for us, you know, we have the right to drive a car, for instance, so then we have the responsibility to be a good driver. But it feels like we have forgotten a lot of the responsibilities for that we have to nature because we live in this culture that disconnects us from nature so much. And you wrote about how you're not culpable for deforestation if you use toilet paper, but you are culpable if you don't keep your end of the bargain because it's your responsibility to use any means necessary to ensure the health of the forest that the trees come from that make the toilet paper. So I, I just wondered if you could speak a little bit to this idea of responsibility and what it means to you and how that connects us with what we need to do in order to defend nature. 
Well, responsibility comes from the root respondere, which means to give in return. And you're exactly right. We've been cut off from nature such that we believe that our food comes from the grocery store and our water comes from the tap. And if your experience is that your food comes from the grocery store and your water comes from the tap, you'll defend to the death the system that brings those to you because your life depends on it. As opposed to if your food comes from a land base and your water comes from a river, you'll defend to the death those because your life depends on it. We, we forget that we have a responsibility to the land and we have been inculcated which comes from the root inculcare, which means to stamp in with the heel, which I love. Um, we've been inculcated into believing that our responsibility is to the system. And, you know, I used to do a lot of talks and, and students would, would at the talk, students would, would be saying things like, what are you going to do when you get out in the real world to each other? And what that meant is, what are you going to do when you have to get a job? And that's extraordinary because for them, the real world is the economic system. And it's not extraordinary on their part. It's extraordinary on the culture's part that the culture has been able to convince us that the real world, like we hear the world's demand for, for electricity. Actually, no, the world doesn't have a demand for electricity. The industrial economy has demand for electricity. You know, it's kind of like um, I learned from Noam Chomsky reading his books a long time ago. He, ought, he will rarely talk about our government. He'll say the U.S. government. And that's a really important point to keep in mind. And it's the same here, that it's not our economy. It's, it's the capitalist economy. And this is really important. George Mambio, who does a lot of really great work, he was talking at one point about how um, one of the reasons that you need to keep the electrical grid going is how else are we going to get the electricity to run our brick factories? And I change a couple words and it becomes much more clear. How else are the capitalists going to get the electricity they need to run their brick factories? That changes everything. Anyway, back to the responsibility and to, and to um, giving back to the land. The, the, the thing you mentioned earlier about uh, toilet paper was I was getting in an argument online with some guy about – this is 15 years ago. God, longer now. With some guy online who said that because I use toilet paper, I'm just as culpable for deforestation as Warehouser, as a CEO of Warehouser. And I said, no, it doesn't seem right, but I didn't really have – an answer, any answer except that. And I, I took a walk through a forest, and and I asked to write it back from from a tree, which said, "You're an animal. You consume things. Get over it." Is that if you consume the flesh of another, you now take responsibility for the continuation of the other's community. And everybody knows this. Everybody knows if the, the bears know if they eat all the salmon, there's not going to be a salmon next year, and that's going to cause them to their population to collapse. And everybody knows this. It's just we forget. And so if I consume flesh of salmon from the Klamath River, I now have to take responsibility to give in return for what they have done for me. I have to take responsibility for the continuation and dignity of their community. And it's the same with toilet paper. If I use toilet paper... I am not culpable for deforestation because I happen to use a sheet of toilet paper. I am culpable for deforestation because I have broken that sacred bond. I did not give back, give in return, the protection of that community. And this is just really a fundamental statement of sustainability, that the only way you can be sustainable, any way, only way you can live sustainably, is if my interactions with the land itself actually improve the land on its own terms. I mean, if we, I'm going to do a silly nerd quantification thing here, but if we presume that the health of, of the land is, you know, the, a fairly healthy land is, is 100 and, um, and devastated land is 1 and we're not going to make 100 the top because land can always get better and better and healthier and healthier, but we'll presume it's pretty healthy at 100 and then if I – take it down to 99, and if I'm taking it down one unit a year, it's going to take 100 years for it to go to zero. And it's very clear to me that the only ways of living that have ever been sustainable are ways that are actually improving the land on, on its own terms. And I know that sounds crazy to people because we're in the midst of this exploitative culture, but think about it. How did the world get to be so wild and fecund and beautiful in the first place? It's by everybody living and dying. It's by the salmon making the forest a better place by their lives and their deaths and by the bears making the forest a better place 
by their lives and their deaths and by everybody living in it, which can include humans, uh, making the place a better place by their lives and their deaths. Does it make the place a better place on its own terms to have a tanker full of oil go through? I don't think so. Does it take – and here's another thing that's really important is to recognize that there is no surplus in nature. So any fish that you take out of the Salish Sea are fish that somebody else doesn't get to eat. And that doesn't mean that you can't eat any fish. What it means is that if you eat any fish, you're now responsible for the continuation of the entire Salish Sea fish community. How do you do that? Well, the way you learn how to do that is by living in place for a long time and by observing. And the most important thing is by making your loyalty to the land itself and making it so your loyalty is not to the economic system that now you're going to use the language of rights of nature to promote the economic system, which is what we see with the entire climate change movement. I mean, they're using the language of protecting the land in order to further industrialize energy harvesting through more means, such as wind, solar. Um, it's just a further industrialization of the planet. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and what you've just talked about to me is – a really good response to people who say, well, you know, if you have another law in place, you're just going to use that to tell me that I can't fish at all. When really, what we hope is that you'll fish responsibly, or you'll farm responsibly so that you do give back to nature what you're taking so that that cycle continues that we're we're constantly helping nature to become more and better, rather than just taking and taking. And if you can't figure out how to fish slash farm slash do whatever it is you're going to do without harming the land base, then you shouldn't do it. Yeah, agreed. Because it's not sustainable. <laughs> but, but that responsibility is on you. I'm not saying you can't fish. I'm just saying that there are consequences. And I mean, this is a moral question. And it's also simply a question of life. Because either we can figure out how to feed ourselves sustainably or we won't. And if we don't, nature's going to clean it up for us and we're not going to like it because it's going to throw away everything that, that we think we hold dear. You know, the other day I was asked, so if, you were, if, you were, if they made you in charge of the economy, what would you do? And the truth is I would not deindustrialize overnight. The truth is I would start with easy things like, okay, no more golf courses and we're going to convert golf courses to prairie or forest or whatever they want to be. And no more retractable stadium roofs. I mean, I would I would go for the low hanging fruit on day one, and I would go on low hanging fruit day one through three hundred, and then and then we can start on some things that are more difficult. I mean, there are so many no brainers. Get real lawns, you know, stuff like that. To just be a piece of cake. Yeah. Anyway, so the point. I'm not saying you can't fish. I'm saying you need to fish without harming the place. And then if you say, well, gosh, I can't fish without harming the place. Then I need to. Then I'll say to you, "Huh? You just acknowledged that your action is destructive, didn't you?" Yes, and therefore not sustainable. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, got a choice. Yeah. So, how do you think? You know, because everybody's gonna, they're gonna disagree about what's sustainable and what's not sustainable. Even, I mean, some of the things are obvious, but even the, you know, for the fishermen, clearly they want to be able to continue fishing. We want them to be able to continue fishing because. That's a source of food, and um, it, it works for a lot of people. But if we say, well, in order to do that sustainably, we need to take down the lower Snake River dams, then, of course, you get the people in eastern Washington who say, well, we need those lo lower Snake River dams in order for our agriculture to be sustainable. So there's going to be differences of opinion about what's sustainable for whom. And I'm curious, you know, how do you – What's a good way to go about resolving those in a way that doesn't cause rifts in communities? Well, there will be rifts in communities because uh, we live in a pluralistic society and people have different competing interests. And those interests um, will often come into conflict. And, you know, I was, I, I'll never forget something that Jeanette Armstrong said to me. She's an Okanagan Indian activist and writer. Um, she said to me, 20 five years ago or something, 20 some years ago that said, you know, we Indians have the same problems that white people do that we, we get mad at each other. We, and so we have to figure out ways to get along. And so 
one of the ways that we have found to figure out how to get along is they have this process that they want for people all over the world to learn, which is called enalkin, E-N apostrophe O-W-K-I-N. And that word means, uh, I challenge you to give me your most opposite perspective to mine so I can increase my understanding. And they use it as a conflict resolution method that, that there will be people who have been trained facilitators to, to facilitate the conflict resolution. So one person would say, you know, uh, those dams need to come out. Somebody else would say those dams need to, to stay up because I need water from the river. And they would try to figure out how to, to get along. But that doesn't mean, by the way, that everybody's voice ends up being the same. And it doesn't mean that it gets resolved to everybody's satisfaction necessarily. And in addition, she said it only works when people who are taking, are taking the process seriously and are not uh, trying to take what you've got. So it only worked within the, the Okanagan community and didn't work with, for example, white people who wanted to take their land. I'm thinking about Sam Mace about taking out the dams on the Lower Snake. And at one point, I asked her a question about, well, so what about hatcheries? And she was very clear about it. It was great. She said, you know, I don't want to talk about hatcheries because some of the people in our alliance are in favor of hatcheries and not something I'm going to talk about here. Point being that when she's in that alliance, she'll go along with hatcheries. I don't know her, but you know, a lot of people really hate hatcheries for the harm they do to, to fish populations. Um, and the point is we can make temporary alliances and we can try to work things through. And then also sometimes we also just have to say that use is not sustainable. And you know, if you take water, I mean the Columbia has been killed both – I mean two things. One is the Columbia has been killed by dams, but also – the Columbia River salmon uh, runs were already in decline before the dams because of canning factories. That level of fish collecting is not sustainable. Yes, the collecting of fish by the Indians who lived along the Columbia River prior to conquest, that was sustainable by definition because they'd been doing it since the last ice age, you know, since, ever since they moved into the region. And it was still working. But as soon as they brought in canning factories, it started going down. And yes, I recognize that we, that people need to make a living within this wretched capitalist system. But that doesn't alter the fact that the land has to be primary. And if you can't figure out how to do it without harming the land, then we got to have an honest discussion about that. And I know that's not a popular position to take. And I mean that's why that's why I that's why I take it because somebody's got to take it and somebody has to speak for the land you know and and we can also make certain compromises there's there's a story I've told a bazillion times that I really love about I was off <clears throat> this is maybe 93 or something like that I was I was up getting getting um firewood back in the from slash piles up in the the national forest and I got, I got a flat tire on my truck and um i had i so i went to look at the spare i hadn't checked the spare in years and my spare was flat and i'm not gonna walk i'm way back there so i'm not gonna walk I'm, just, I'm thumping out on a flat tire about one mile an hour and i get to this guy's house and ask him if i can borrow a pump and he says no i don't have a pump it's uh, but 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 i i do have a spare i can give you and he gave me a spare which is really nice so i i put the spare on i drove home you know an hour and a half or whatever and then the next day, I got my tire fixed, and my mom made him a cake, and then I took the cake up uh, and took a spare tire back to thank him for that. And he said, hey, you want to come in and have a piece of cake? So we went and had a piece of cake. He's got chainsaws all over his wall. And then, I mean, he's clearly a logger. And then he says, oh, by the way, do you want – I got more firewood out back. I got tons of it. You want me to cut you some lengths to put in your truck? I said, sure. That'd be great. So we go out back. He's standing there holding a chainsaw, and he says – by the way, what do you do for a living? I'm thinking, oh, crap. I say, well, I'm, I'm a writer. He says, well, what do you write? And I'm thinking science fiction, fantasy, romance. I'm a, I'm a terrible liar, though. So I say, well, I'm right now I'm writing a book about how the big four timber companies got their land illegally from the public domain. That's railroads and clear cuts. 
And he starts swearing and he turns red in the face and I'm looking for a break in the fence. And it takes me about a minute to realize that he's swearing because he's an independent logger who's been put out of business by Plum Creek. And he hates the company even more than I do, which I didn't think was possible. And it takes us another 30 seconds before we got our arms around each other's shoulders, just laughing and swapping atrocity stories, how much we hate Plum Creek. And then we say, okay, okay we're going to take down Plum Creek past your logging. So after we take down Plum Creek, Potlatch, Boise Cascade, and Warehouser, I'm coming after you. And then we both just laughed our asses off because we recognized that that difference is primarily theoretical. So my point is, I think that we can do what my approach is to go ahead and make temporary alliances and make alliances with fishermen and say, yeah, sure, you can do this in the short term, but at the same time, always being honest and saying, look, is there a problem in the Sailor Sea with foreign trawlers? I don't know if there is or not. I don't know the Sailor Sea. But if there's foreign trawlers, first off, that's the first thing. Get rid of them. Are there factory trawlers? First thing, get rid of them. And then I got to tell you, once we get rid of the factory trawlers, once we get rid of those huge ships, then I'm going to look. I'm going to come after you. But you and I can agree. In the in, in the meantime, we can work together. And I've never understood why that's not a more popular position. That there's not. You don't get with somebody you disagree with. Um, and at the same time, being clear, this is where we disagree. And that's why Sam Mace was such a beautiful example of that. That it was very clear to me, at least, that, okay, in this particular discussion of removing the dams on the lower snake, we are not going to talk about hatcheries. And maybe a different time we can talk about hatcheries. But that's not my focus right now because I don't think the hatcheries are causing as much harm as the dams on the lower snake. We get rid of the dams on the lower snake, then we can go after the hatcheries. That makes a lot of sense. And I, I like that approach, too, because, like you said, there are so many big harms, whether it's the foreign trawlers or the, the, or the dams or whatever that we can, that would make such a difference to the Sailor Sea in terms of the health of the Sailor Sea before we ever got to worrying about whether some guy with his two-person business is doing harm to the Sailor Sea. Exactly. You and I are going to be, you know, dead and, and our bones ash before we have to worry about that. Because we got our, we got enough on our hands taking out the getting the dams removed on the, the lower snake. And once we get rid of the dams, honestly, this two-person business is causing less harm than, I'm sorry, the dams that are on the Columbia itself. Let's, let's, let's go first for the dams on the lower snake, and then let's talk about the dams on the Columbia. Going back to what you said earlier about, you know, the, the rivers need the salmon and the forests need the salmon, I hadn't realized before I read your books about how the salmon in particular are so important to the health of the entire ecosystem, including the forests themselves. And so I just kind of wanted to end talking about the web of life and and how important that is to the Sailor Sea region. And if you have any thoughts you want to share about that, because it is clear to me as we talk to the community about rates of the Sailor Sea, even if people are against the law, they care deeply about this region and they want it to be healthy. And so to me, that speaks volumes about what you said earlier about, you know, people do talk to nature. They do care about nature. Um, so if you have any thoughts to share about the web of life, I'd love to end on that note. Well, before that is, and I'm sorry, this is an ignorant question. What precisely, what, what are the boundaries of the Sailor Sea? Well, what we've been talking about when we speak to the community about it is actually the entire bioregion. We include the the sea, uh, the watersheds, the forests, everything within that the bioregion. When you see that map of the Salish Sea that you know goes up into Canada and includes up to the crest of the mountains. Well, one reason I ask is because I just remembered, uh, gosh, back in the '90s when I was working on. Oh, I think it was on working on railroads and clear cuts with George. George lives in Seattle. Um, we're driving by Green River, and he just offhand comments that it's one of the most polluted rivers in the country. And, you know, 
Boeing was in that region, and there's there's been all sorts of high tech stuff and all sorts of extremely dirty industries. I don't know. That's not really the web of life. That's just it's. I don't understand how people think you can foul your own nest and not be harmed by it. Um, but but to to go a more more, more positive direction, um, yeah, salmon. I don't know the numbers. There are there are people who study salmon who know these numbers, but it's extraordinary how. So I'm going to make up the numbers. Don't quote these because I'm I'm making them up. But it's like a tree in a salmon dependent forest that has a healthy run of salmon will grow like 40 percent faster, some huge amount faster, because of the nutrients devout, driven up into the forest. Salmon are a huge nutrient pump from the ocean. You know, if you have a million salmon. And there were runs bigger than that. But if you have a million salmon who weigh 20 to 40 pounds of each, that's that's 20 to 40 million pounds of salmon in that run. That are that's 20 to 40 million pounds of flesh that are moving their way up up into the the land, and then that gets eaten by bears, and the bears then go and poop, and then insects eat the poop, and raccoons and foxes eat the poop. And raccoons and foxes eat the, the, the salmon, and eagles eat the salmon, insects eat the salmon. There's, I don't know, I'm, I'm making up the number again, but there's like 240 different animals eat the salmon, including baby salmon. A significant portion of their, of their food is their, their, their dead ancestors. And that's only animals. Those are plants. How many plants eat them? This is something that used to piss me off back in the 90s, that newspaper people would understand that Journalists would understand that changes in the Japanese housing market would affect demand for trees from the Pacific Northwest. So they understood that the economic system is heavily intertwined. But if you say to those same people, gosh, maybe it's a bad idea if we let salmon go extinct they'll say what's the big deal they understand intimately there are entire studies of macroeconomics that are about all of these complex interrelations between different parts of the economy and how they interact such that if you know somebody sets off a bomb in madrid then how is that going to affect the price of silver in Tokyo or some other crazy thing. And at the same time, these very same people blithely wipe out entire biomes and ignore that these biomes are all interrelated. And it's, it's, it's bad faith is what it is. It's not even stupidity. And... I'm sorry, I was supposed to do a stirring, positive rendition of Web of Life, and I end up grousing about people using claims to virtue again. Um, but it, it's, I, I am, it boggles my mind. The lack of curiosity that people will have, too, about, you know, it was, American Indians would say that various nations would say that you can't kill the prairie dogs because if you do, the the rain on the prairie will dry up. And white people thought that that was, oh, just stupid Indian legends. But it ends up that science is finally catching up to what observers, close observers, had known forever, which is that prairie dogs actually do bring the rain through through their burrowing. They, they affect the hydrologic cycle profoundly. You know, so many people have said this to me, and I've said this to myself so many times. I think the first and most important thing that we have to do is to make our loyalty to the land itself and to make our curiosity about the land and to ask questions like, if I feed raccoons, will that harm bird populations? Or if I cut back the Himalayan blackberries here, Will that harm birds? Will that will the will the harm 
be greater to those who eat the blackberries than it is than than there is a gain from uh, from from letting native species grow in that place. I think those are important questions to ask that can only be asked with sincerity and with that the, the answers are only meaningful if you ask with sincerity and humility. And I think that's the real thing is that we need to ha take an approach to the natural world and figure that a forest knows better what it needs than we do. I love what David Ehrenfeld said about a forest is not the world is not only more complex than we think it's more complex than we're capable of thinking. But presume that the forest knows best what it needs and then follow its lead. The dogs are barking because um, there's bears outside. Oh, <laughs> that's great. I'm glad you're being visited by bears. Yeah, me too, usually. <laughs> well, what you just said also speaks to me that, you know, this, this idea that we have to have long-term observations of how our tiny little place in the world works in order to understand whether it's better to cut down the invasive blackberry or leave it for the birds. That takes time and attention and being in a place and and being willing to spend the time. And unfortunately, our culture doesn't leave a lot of room for that anymore. Well, that's a really good point. And I think, I think that sort of attention is really important. At the same time, if you... Um, if you see that someone is being stabbed to death, you don't need to have a medical degree to know that this stabbing is harming them. So yes, there are things we can certainly figure out in the long term, but at the same time, there are things that, like the oil in this in the ships, which is just a terrible idea. Oil out of ships is an even worse idea, and we know that the planet is being stabbed to death, is being flayed alive. And there, there, there are certainly things we can do to stop the immediate damage. Yes, there are. Well, that's a good place to end. I want to thank you so much for your time and for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you so much. So somebody asked me to do a video on how to listen to nature. And I think, I think the real question is how to listen, because I think, frankly, most of us don't listen very well most of the time, even to humans. And I'm thinking about, have you ever been in a situation where there's a group of people talking and somebody says, somebody's telling a story and then instead of actually listening to the story, you sort of glom on to one thing they say, and then you basically wait till they take a breath so that you can now tell your story. And that's not really listening. That's waiting for an opportunity to, to, to push your own agenda, which is fine. That happens sometimes, but it's not really listening. And I think about that with nature too, that, that, the first step of listening to nature is to understand that nature has something to say. And if you don't presume it has anything to say, but instead presume that you're simply looking around for an excuse for you to pontificate, well, then you'll soon find an excuse to pontificate. Um, but in terms of actually listening to nature, it's, 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 it's all very interesting. And I, I think about this first with, you know, people have said, how do we do interspecies communication? They've asked me that question a lot. And I always think about first, um, you know, has anybody ever had a dog or a cat, the, a friend that, that, who is who's a dog or a cat? And you know that the, then I mean, you have communication with them all the time. If the, if the food dish is empty, they might look at the food dish, look at you, look at the food dish, look at you until you finally figure out what the deal is or, um, or all sorts of circumstances that you have known. And there's a story I've told before that I just love, which is I'm at my mom's house and, um, you know, my house is down there. And I used to have some dogs who were 
of mine, they didn't come into my mom's house. And I would come up to see my mom and, um, and then they would stay outside on the porch out there. And then when I would uh, go home, they would get up and walk home with me. Or if I would go into town, they wouldn't even get off the porch. They wouldn't even sit up. They would just look at me and keep lying there. And it took me about a year to figure out how do they know? I thought they were reading my mind. How do they know that I'm going into town and not going home? And then I suddenly, after a year, I realized what it is, which is if I have my car keys in my hand, I'm going into town. And so they don't need to bother to get up. If I'm going home, I don't have my car keys in my hand. And for me, that's the essence of communication, which is simply paying attention to detail. And it's the same with other non-humans and with nature in general. The first thing is, and recognizing they don't speak English, don't speak human, like how then do they communicate? How do they make their needs known? And it's gonna be different depending on the different species. And you know, there's a, a cosmic story I mean, it doesn't always have to be cosmic, but there's a kind of a cosmic story that I love telling, which is soon after I moved here, I felt like, you know, sort of a good Nazi. I'm a nice guy, but I'm still jackboot. I'm still a, an industrial human who is, you know, one of the enemy to nature because industrial civilization and, and most humans at this point have declared war on the natural world and are just destroying it. And I kept saying to the land, you know, I want to be, I want to help. And I would like throw food out and I would give various offerings. And I still felt that the land wasn't, uh, was still wary as anybody would be, but could I be projecting? I don't know. Um, and then one day I was walking through the forest and, or I walked down a path and I saw some strange footprints. Uh, they were human footprints. They weren't mine. I recognized that the, he that the shoe was not my shoe. So somebody else has been there. And I go, I, I see that they head off the path at some point. So I follow them and I find this guy hiding in the forest. And I say, what are you doing? And he says, nothing. And I keep talking to him and I, I, I find out that he's been cutting burls off the trees. and. So I, um, I tell him that he can't cut the burls off the trees and I escort him off the land. He comes back the next day and I say the same thing again. You can't cut the trees. These trees are protected. You can't do this. And, um, and then he didn't come back. And in the three days or so after that, I saw the biggest pile of, pile of bear poop I had seen to that time. I saw the biggest red-legged frog I've seen to that time. And I was walking through the forest and a bird flew out of the underbrush and brushed my, wing, brushed my chest with its wing. And that felt to me like, well, the first paragraph, of a language older than words is there is a language older by far and deeper than words. It is a language of gesture, sim symbol, memory, dream. It's a language of metaphor. I'm kind of butchering it, but you get the idea. And oh, it's the language of wind on snow, rain on tree, something like that. Anyway, the point is that that's how nature communicates. And ever since then, the forest has treated me differently because I made clear, yes, I am actually going to help protect you. And I mean, since then, seeing a big pile of bear poop, I mean, for crying out loud, last night there were four bears sitting right out there just hanging out. And so how do you have a communication? By opening yourself up to the understanding that they exist and then waiting and talking and listening. And I think of something a lot that a friend of mine said about how you become friends with a pigeon. 
And the way you become friends with a pigeon or any bird is you stand there like this with food in your hand and you don't move and you just wait and you just wait. And that's how you feed a wild animal is that you stand there and you wait and you give them something, you give them a gift. And then I want to say one more thing too, which is that I often have told the story of how I wrote, how I didn't write, how, how the most beautiful thing I've ever written is the pretend you're a river part of Endgame, and I didn't actually write it. The way it was written was that I was wondering what I think is the most important question of all, which is what is it like to be you? And that's the most important question in any relationship. And I was wondering what it's like to be a river. And I'm trying to write what it's like to be a river, and I'm writing, I'm stuck for several days. I can't get anywhere. And then I realized how stupid that is. Why should I try to write what it's like to be a river when I live 50 feet from a stream? Why would I write it? That'd be like me writing, what is it like to be a woman when I can just ask a woman? Uh, duh. So I walked down to the stream and I said, what is it like to be you? And just like that, the, uh, the stream had been waiting for a human to ask that question because the entire, you know, several pages came to me instantly. I mean, the, 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 the stream said it. And then I just, I, I was like, what is it like to be you? I stood there for like two seconds. And then I said, thanks, ran into the house as fast as I could. And then just wrote everything that the stream had said. And that's it. And I didn't even edit it. It's just, that's, that was it. And how do you learn how to listen to nature? By asking. You have been listening to The Green Flame, a DGR podcast. You can find us at dgrnewsservice.org on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever else you listen to your podcasts. Please rate the show and leave us a review. To support this podcast or to become involved with DGR and volunteer for the organization, you can go to deepgreenresistance.org. We welcome your support. Outside.